International trade depends on two factors, energy and the ability to move precious cargo around the world as quickly as possible. Today, we use fossil fuels to spin the wheel of the global economy, but can nuclear power do a better job? And what other applications can be used on the high seas? That and more on today's episode. I'm Sean Kenny, and this is Rock Logic. again and welcome to Rock Logic. I'm your host Sean Kenny and today we'll be talking about nuclear power as it relates to trade and the global economy. In previous episodes I've discussed floating nuclear plants like the ones being designed by Thorcon and I've certainly discussed the economic benefits of molten salt reactors. But today we're going to be going in a different direction. I'm going to discuss nuclear marine propulsion as well as nuclear powered applications that can be done in the high seas. Now, to get started, nuclear-powered ships are not a new concept. The U.S. Navy, as well as other navies around the world, have used nuclear reactors to power vessels in one way or another. The U.S. has the largest nuclear fleet in the world, with over 11 aircraft carriers, including the Ford and Nimitz class, as well as dozens of nuclear-powered submarines that use smaller reactors. They can run for months or even years at a time without ever having to refuel. Have there been commercial examples? As a matter of fact, yes. In 1959, the U.S. launched the NS Savannah as part of the Atoms for Peace initiative. It was the first nuclear-powered cargo ship to cross the Atlantic and only one of four ships made in the entire world that was made for commercial use. It was decommissioned in the 1970s due to capital and operational cost overruns. Today, there are almost half a dozen nuclear-powered icebreakers that have been built and operated in Russia to transport cargo in the Arctic. Another three are currently under construction, with the capability of operating for seven years without refueling. The Russians are building these because they are far more powerful than their conventional counterparts, and they do an outstanding job pushing through the ice. Even in nine feet thick ice, they can move continuously at two knots and in open sea about ten times that. Now, there are 10,000 cargo container ships in the world, and they consume 10% of the world's oil just to keep them going. Pretty much all of them use what's called bunker fuel. That is basically heavy oil left over after turning light crude into gasoline and diesel fuel. It's really nasty stuff and makes a significant amount of air and ocean pollution on major trade routes around the world. So there is a major environmental precedent to change things, but can nuclear reactors on commercial ships really be practical? After all, earlier iterations were too costly to mass produce. If you remember my earlier episodes, I discussed the economic and cost advantages that MSRs have over light water reactors. They are smaller, more compact, and have inherent safety features that other reactors don't. They can even be mass produced in assembly lines, which in turn reduce their overall capital expenditures. And because the fuel is liquid, there is no specialized fuel fabrication required, which also helps with the operational simplicity and costs. Once this technology becomes a norm, it's not unlikely that we could start seeing a whole shipbuilding industry around this. Hell, even Thorcon might consider doing it once they start commercial rollout of their reactors. Now, I don't have all the numbers to see what it would take to replace all these ships with nuclear-powered cargo vessels. I can only assume that even with mass production bringing these costs down, it would still be more expensive than fossil fuel variants. At which point, one has to ask the question, is the market strong enough to build 10,000 of these bad boys? The simple answer is no, of course not. But that doesn't mean that the MSR idea is dead. We just have to get a little bit more creative here with our long-term solution. Now, I don't have all the numbers to see what it would cost to replace all these ships with nuclear-powered cargo vessels. I can only assume that even with mass production bringing costs down, it would still be more expensive than their fossil fuel variants, at which point one has to ask, is the market strong enough to build 10,000 of these bad boys? The simple answer is no, of course not. But that doesn't mean that the MSR idea is dead. We just have to get more creative here with our long-term solution. Of those 10,000 cargo vessels, about 40% of those are used to ship fossil fuels from oil and gas rich countries to everywhere else around the globe. I've discussed the potential of using Lifter to not just make synthetic liquid fuels from coal, but also municipal solid waste and pretty much any carbon feedstock when paired with a plasma gasifier. Giving every country on earth the ability to do this would make them less reliant on oil and gas imports. And if we assume that electric cars and trucks are going to replace gas guzzlers, then hey, we can stop using four thousand of those dirty ships, thus reducing fossil fuel consumption by another 4% globally. 
That still leaves us with 6,000 ships to handle everything else. It's daunting, but we're off to a great start. Again, the question is, is the market going to be strong enough to build them? Probably not enough to build 6,000 ships. Maybe a couple hundred, maybe a thousand. But here's a fun idea. What if you could build a ship without a reactor and still have it be nuclear powered? Do I have your attention? Good, because the fun part's about to begin. For years, the U.S. Navy's Naval Research Lab has been hard at work to develop cost-effective measures to utilize naval reactors like the one on the USS Gerald Ford and use the excess power to make jet fuel. The process involves extracting carbonic acid collected from the world's oceans as well as splitting hydrogen from water to make hydrocarbon fuels. The end result is JP-8 jet fuel and diesel that is almost indistinguishable from their petroleum counterparts. We know it's possible, and the Navy plans on using light water reactors to do the job. MSRs can do an even better job, and potentially at a fraction of the cost. So here's the pitch. Instead of making a fleet of thousands of nuclear-powered ships to import and export goods, let's build a network of floating offshore nuclear stations. They can power nearby coastal cities using underwater HVDC cables, as well as desalinate fresh water for commercial use. They can make carbon-neutral fuels to power those ships that will make them cleaner, and you don't have to build any specialized equipment to receive them in port. You also don't have to deal with any regulatory hassles with countries like New Zealand that refuse to accept nuclear-powered ships. As an added benefit, we can also appeal to the shipping industry to be more profitable. Most shipping companies make it a habit to reduce speeds to cut down on fuel consumption. This saves on costs and reduces emissions. However, if these fuels are made as a byproduct of producing electricity for coastal cities, and if the environmental impact has been significantly reduced, you could sell these fuels at a much lower price. That would give these companies an incentive to increase speeds and shorten travel times on transoceanic routes. We can reduce the shipping costs cost to some degree as well. While we're at it, we can reduce global electricity rates by about tenfold. Island nations and remote locations rely on imported diesel and fuel oil to run their economies. The average rate of electricity can be anywhere between 50 and 60 cents per kilowatt hour. You can't run an economy at those rates, and many of these countries are living in sub-Saharan levels of poverty. But with a molten salt reactor, you can drop it down to about a nickel per kilowatt hour, thus improving quality of life significantly. Imagine the possibilities here. States like Hawaii or even whole island countries with no energy reserves to speak of can be independent from fossil fuel imports altogether. They can power cities with zero emissions and make fuel and water at the same time. Seems like a great idea to me, but can we push it even further? The idea of floating cities comes to mind. A while back, Patrick Friedman and Joe Quirk had this idea called seasteading or homesteading in the high seas. The idea was simple. When you go far enough offshore from a country, eventually you hit international waters, a maritime boundary in which no country's laws apply. If you build floating communities, you could experiment with differing styles of governance and free society. Of course, the idea didn't just appeal to libertarians. Institutions like the United Nations are concerned about potential refugee crises as a result of rising sea levels. Floating cities could be used to provide shelters or permanent homes for climate refugees of countries devastated by severe weather. The idea would involve operating on renewable energies to the highest extent possible, but what if we applied the molten salt reactor to the equation? In addition to it surpassing all of their energy needs, you can provide clean water and recycle waste to the highest rate of efficiency. Produce can be grown in lush greenhouses year-round using LED lights. Transportation needs can be met by electric vehicles or synthetic fuels made on site. We could even consider cleaner manufacturing practices, creating jobs for not just refugees, but anyone looking to earn better wages and live a better life. While we're at it, we might even be obligated to use that massive energy budget to help clean our oceans and revive our marine sanctuaries. The idea of having access to clean and abundant energy provides limitless potential, not just to live, but live better, while also being better stewards of the environment that we inhabit. I could go on forever and probably will in future episodes, seeing as there are a bunch of applications I haven't gotten to. If you think I left anything out, please drop a comment in and maybe I'll bring it up in a later episode. For now, I'm Sean Kenny, and this is Rock Logic. Hey, thank you so much for uh, watching today's episode. Uh, we're a new podcast, so we really appreciate if you like this video and subscribe to it. My producer, Jessica, says that I'll get a cookie uh, for every new subscriber we get. Maybe if I'm good enough, she'll let me outside. Yeah, all right. Hmm. 
that's good. That's a good cookie.